สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our Pali Canon and English Study Group, where we study the words of the Buddha. This is a program that we've been conducting now for a year and a half, and we're at the very last volume of the book series. We're in the very last part of that book. This is the last class for this one and a half year series of classes that I've been teaching on the Pali Canon and English, where we've been going through and deeply studying the words of the Buddha. And talking about the teachings related to what he's actually been sharing, students have been studying these before class and after class. We come to class and study them. So, if this is your first time joining, I'd like to welcome all of you guys. And next Saturday, we're going to be restarting from the very beginning of this program. It, this program doesn't require you to start at the beginning. You can start at any time. But over this year and a half, it's kind of nice to start from the beginning. So if you'd like to start with us at the beginning, you can go to BuddhaDailyWisdom.com, and you'll see that there's a link for online classes. And there, you'll see the words of the Buddha Pali Canon English Study Group, where you can see all the details of the program, and you can sign up. In fact, if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook or listening on the podcast or something like that, there should be a link available for you there to click on the Pali Canon and English Study. Study group and see it for yourself. Because next Saturday we're going to be starting from the very beginning, which is Volume Two, Chapters One through Ten. And as I mentioned, students can actually read these chapters beforehand. They're actually pretty straightforward and they're very short. We say ten chapters, but sometimes that can be like two paragraphs or one. Uh, half a page or something like that. So it might take you an hour, hour and a half to actually read, but I suggest that you just do it little by little. Uh, today is all about finishing up this particular program so that we can round out all the different books and all the different chapters. But as you're looking for these books in preparation for next week's class, you can go to BuddhaDailyWisdom.com and there you'll see a link for free books and you'll see all the books there. And what you'd be interested to do is take a look at. Uh, volume two, vo chapters one through ten. Those are the ones we're going to be studying next week. And if you haven't studied with me before, you may even be interested to look at the group learning program, which has just recently restarted as well. And you'll find that in the same place at the same website under online learning. You'll see the link for. Group learning program. That's a wonderful place to establish your foundation in these teachings, and then use this Pali Canon and English Study Group to kind of supplement it. There's these two programs that I teach online: Sunday and Wednesday, and then this program is on Saturday. So I'd like to welcome all of you guys. If you're joining for the first time or you've been joining regularly, we have eight chapters to explore today. So this gives us a bit more time to do our meditation and talk and have any kind of discussions that you guys would like to have as part of this. Class, there's moderators who are looking at Facebook, YouTube, and Zoom. So as you have questions, you'll be able to put those into the comment section, and they'll be able to ask your question during the class. If you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow up questions directly. So first, we start with meditation. Then we'll move into reading each individual chapter here in class. I'll share some teachings on that, and then we'll open up to any questions that you guys might have. So, if you guys would like to join for meditation, I'd like to invite you for that. You can go ahead and take whatever position you're comfortable with, whether it's seating, uh, seated, lying, standing. Uh, walking doesn't usually work too well, but hey, if you've got walking available to you during the live stream, you can go ahead and use that. I use that at other times, but during live streaming, it doesn't usually work too well. So, uh, feel. Free Free to take whatever position you like. I'm here sitting in a chair, but some people might choose to sit on the floor. And if you sit on the floor, you might put a cushion under your rear. You might lightly cross your legs, just keeping some, uh, you know, gaps between your hips, knees, and ankles. Your hands and arms, you can rest those comfortably in your lap. You can put the right hand over the left with the thumbs together, and then put that in your lap. That's one option. You can put the palms on the thighs, the knees, the palms up. If you have a armrest on your chair, you might just put your arms on the armrest of the chair. You would like your upper body to be nice and erect. This keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation because this is a dedicated, active, purposeful training session where you're actively training the mind. So keeping the upper body erect ensures that the mind stays attentive and alert during the meditation. Next, just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. 
Here you're just establishing the breath, breathing in gradually through the nose and out through the nose. I'm going to do some chanting to ease us into meditation, and then I'll be back with some light guidance to help you get deeper into your meditation. You're welcome to join in the chants if you know these. Otherwise, I'll be back after the chants to guide you in meditation. <clears throat> Otang make one hung a piva te me Savakato make wata tamo Damang namasami. Supati pano emakewato Sawaka sanko Sankang namami Napoer sabakewato Arato Sama Samputasa Napmur Sabhakawato Arato Sama Samputasa Napmur Sabhakawato Arato Sama Samputasa Iti Piso Mahakawa Arahan Sama Samoto we cha cha ra rang sa mo ro sa ka to ro ka wi to anu te ro pu ri sa da ma sa ti sa ta ta wa ma nu sa rang Oto Pakawati <clears throat> Here you should just be breathing in through the nose and out through the nose, experiencing the full breath. Breathing in. in out your breath isn't going to necessarily match up with the guidance that i'm providing so wherever you get to the next inhale just breathe in gradually through the nose experiencing the full breath then when you get to the exhale breathe out gradually through the nose experiencing the full exhale Once the breath is established, start fixating the mind on the breath, the sound of the breath, or the sensation of air moving into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. And out. As you observe that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to label the thought, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Just wherever you observe that the mind is off the breath, 
cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. In, out. I'm going to be quiet now, let you do this work of focusing on the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in. In, out.
to slowly make your way out of meditation I'll go ahead and switch things over for our class where we can read each of the chapters today the 81 through chapters 88 so I'll just turn things over to all of you guys specifically the moderators and then I'll be back as you guys read to share teachings on each individual chapter yes thank you sir um, Chrissy would you read chapter 81 for us, please? Sure. Um, developing, developing and cultivating a mind of loving kindness and practicing the way to the aesthetic. In that case, monk, you should train yourself thus. My mind will be firm and well settled internally. Arisen evil unwholesome states will not obsess my mind. Thus should not Thus should you train yourself. When monk, your mind is firm and well settled internally and arisen evil unwholesome states do not obsess your mind, then you should train yourself thus. I will develop and cultivate the liberation of the mind by loving kindness. Make it a vehicle and basis. Carry it out, consolidate it and properly undertake it. Thus should you train yourself. When monk, this consideration has been developed and well developed by you in this way, then you should train yourself thus. I will develop and cultivate the liberation of the mind by compassion, the liberation of the mind by sympathetic joy, the liberation of the mind by equanimity, Make it a vehicle and basis, carry it out, consolidate it, and properly undertake it. Thus, you should train yourself. He sees himself purified of all these evil, unwholesome states. He sees himself liberated from them. 
When he sees this, joyfulness is born in him. When he is joyful, joy is born in him. In one who is joyous, the body becomes tranquil. One whose body is tranquil feels pleasure. In one who feels pleasure, the mind becomes concentrated. He resides filling one quarter with a mind filled with loving kindness. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth. So above, below, around, and everywhere. And to all as to himself, he resides filling the all-encompassing world with a mind filled with loving kindness, abundant, distinguished, immeasurable, without hostility, and without ill will. He resides filling one quarter with a mind filled with compassion, with a mind filled with symp sympathetic joy, with a mind filled with equanimity, abundant, distinguished, immeasurable, without hostility, and without ill will. Suppose there were a pond with clear, agreeable, cool water, transparent, with smooth banks, delightful. If a man scorched and exhausted by, weather, by hot weather, weary, parched, and thirsty, came from the east or from the west, or from the north or from the south, or from where you will, having come upon the pond, he would quench his thirst and his hot fever. So too, monks, if anyone from a clan of nobles goes forth from the home life into homelessness, and after encountering the teachings, the discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata develops loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity, and thereby gains internal peace. Then because of that internal peace, he practices the way proper to the ascetic, I say. Just as if a mighty trumpeter were with little difficulty to make a proclamation to the four quarters. So by this cultivation and development, the seta, by this liberation of the mind through loving kindness, through compassion, through sympathetic joy, through equanimity, he leaves nothing untouched, nothing unaffected in the sensuous sphere. Monks, when the, liberated, when the liberation of the mind by loving kindness has been pursued, developed, and cultivated, made a vehicle and basis, carried out, consolidated, and properly undertaken, 11 benefits are to be predicted. What 11? One sleeps well, one awakens with joy, one does not have bad dreams. One is pleasing to human beings. One is pleasing to spirits. Heavenly beings protect one. Fire, poisons, and weapons do not injure one. One's mind quickly becomes concentrated. One's facial complexion is serene. One dies unconfused. And if one does not penetrate further, one fares on to the Brahma world. When monks, the liberation of the mind by loving kindness has been repeatedly pursued, developed, and cultivated, made a vehicle and basis, carried out, consolidated, and properly undertaken, these 11 benefits are to be predicted. Thank you, Chrissy. First, let me help you guys understand why we're seeing this in this particular book. This book is all about generosity. And the Buddha has been talking at different times to help you understand individuals who to practice giving and sharing with, how to do that and all other different types of things. And one group of people that you might choose to 
uh, practice generosity towards which produces merit is aesthetics or ordained practitioners, teachers who have given up worldly life in choosing to dedicate their time to sharing the teachings of the Buddha. And in those different chapters, he's explained what to kind of look for in somebody's practice, that you're supporting virtuous practitioners because you're interested in your offerings going towards somebody who's deeply doing the work and then they're sharing those teachings with others this is the mutual support that the buddha built in to the way that his teachings are shared in the world that household practitioners are out in the world working doing different jobs earning money and they're encountering various struggles and various challenges in their life so they're coming to teachers and aesthetics or dame practitioners to get help and as they're getting help the Teachers and ordained practitioners are sharing teachings with the household practitioners to help improve their life. And this mutual exchange is that there's different offerings that are offered from uh, students to these teachers and ordained practitioners. And then the teachers and ordained practitioners are sharing teachings to help the individual to grow their life as a household practitioner. And the offerings are helping that individual ordained practitioner or teacher to get deeper into their practice because now they have more time to do that and they have the resources they need to be able to share the teachings. So here, this particular chapter is in here so that you can identify some of the qualities of mind that somebody would be practicing that would be wise for you to make offerings to because they're deeply understanding the teachings and practicing them well and thus able to share the teachings to help others. So here the Buddha is talking mainly about loving kindness, but he's talking about all the Brahma Viharas. These are four healthy mental states that I talk about in volume one of this book series and that the Buddha talks about at different places in his teachings. It's loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. These are qualities that you would be looking for in other people to make offerings to, but these are also qualities that you need to cultivate in your own mind in order to get to enlightenment. You wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment without cultivating these four healthy mental states. So you could look in volume one, chapter 14, where I describe those in detail. I talk about what each individual uh, quality of mind is and uh, what it's antidoting and how to cultivate it and things like that. So that's why it's here. Just Real briefly, loving kindness is a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, uh, having this active goodwill towards all beings. Compassion is the concern for the misfortune of others. Sympathetic joy is having joy for other success, even if you didn't contribute to it. And equanimity is calmness, composure, evenness of temper, especially in difficult situations, and treating all beings equally and fairly. And these four healthy mental states are antidoting very specific things in the mind that when you arise these qualities in the mind, you're antidoting or solving the problem of things like anger, hatred, ill will, or indifference, or worry, or anxiety, or jealousy, or envy, or uh, you know, a, a busy, overactive mind, an anxious mind. So these qualities need to be cultivated in your mind, and you can cultivate those with loving kindness. You can do that through meditation. The others of compassion, sympathetic joint equanimity, those get brought into the mind through observing with mindfulness when the unwholesome quality has arisen and then cutting that off and letting it go and applying the effort to arise the wholesome. So when you understand the unwholesome qualities that these healthy mental states are antidoting, when you see them arise, you can cut those unwholesome qualities off and then apply the right effort to arise the wholesome. And these are things that you would be looking for in somebody that you're interested in supporting in terms of making offerings for merit. Now, as we talked about, there is generosity where you can just practice generosity with anybody and everybody. But as you're directing it towards ordained practitioners or teachers, you would be looking for someone who's practicing loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity. You can even ask the those people that you might be choosing to consider making an offering to, what are these four mental states? You know, can you explain them to me? Uh, what do they antidote? And if this person is understanding and able to teach it, then they surely should be practicing it, or there's a good chance that they are practicing it. And then the Buddha describes here, which is really interesting, is he's talking about the benefits of practicing these four healthy mental states. 
And this is where you can see as you're training your mind more and more, you're getting closer and closer to enlightenment, that you sleep very well. Your sleep can oftentimes improve as you get closer to, to enlightenment, it'll really improve because you no longer have this pollution of mind where the mind is worried and just sitting around with craving and staying up uh, all hours of the night because you have difficulties falling asleep. Uh, there's this joy, even when you wake up in the morning, you haven't done anything, nothing's happened yet, but you just have this joy. You don't have bad dreams. Uh, other uh, beings, other human beings see you as pleasing and agreeable because you're never doing anything harmful to others. So therefore harm isn't coming back to you. So people around you will see you as pleasing perhaps. Not everybody because of impermanence, but a good majority of people will uh, really consider you to be very pleasing. There's going to be some people who will be jealous that you're so cheerful all the time, right? And they're going to be envious of you. So it's not like every single person is going to consider you to be pleasing, but a large majority of human beings will. Same thing with spirits. The Buddha is saying that these afflicted spirits will see you as pleasing as well. So you won't get affected by any kind of demons or any kind of like really evil spirits or things like that, your mind will be protected from all of that. And here he talks about heavenly beings protecting you as well. Uh, fire, poison, weapons don't injure one because when you're practicing and you're understanding the teachings really well, then you're not going to be putting yourself in situations where these things can injure you, right? Because if you're uh, being threatened to be killed with a knife or with a gun or something like this, you've made decisions that have led up to that. Uh, it's not just going to happen by happenstance, right? So by you practicing these teachings well, then you'll see that these things won't injure you. The mind can become concentrated, and this is based on the Eightfold Path and then uh, also practicing these four healthy mental states because by practicing these four healthy mental states, you're pushing out a lot of the pollution related to what's causing uh, those unwholesome qualities to arise. So by bringing in these wholesome Brahma Viharas, you're getting rid of these unwholesome qualities of mind and the, uh, the discontentedness associated with it. You might notice that your facial complexion will improve the skin color, the tone, the tightness of your skin. Oftentimes people look much younger as they are practicing the teachings more and more closely. The face looks very serene. You don't see this sadness and you know this despair, but instead there's this uplifted uh, appearance on the face and the face can even look much younger. Uh, one does uh, dies unconfused. What confused is, is that ignorance or a knowing of true reality, the misunderstanding, that if we don't understand the five realms, if we don't understand uh, rebirth and enlightenment and craving and all these things, if we don't understand those, when we get close to death, uh, there's going to be fear. There's going to be confusion. You might even fear you know, dying because you're not sure what's next. Um, but that confusion is eliminated when you're practicing these teachings because if you're practicing these four Brahma Viharas, as the Buddha ultimately shares here, is that um, you're at a minimum going to be reborn into this Brahma world, which is essentially the heavenly realm. Uh, Brahma is a representation of God. That's how they referred to God during the lifetime of the Buddha, much like a Muslim would refer to them as Allah. In English, we refer to God as God. Uh, here, during the lifetime of the Buddha, they refer to God as Brahma. So the Buddha is essentially saying you'll be unconfused at death. Uh, because if you're practicing these four Brahma Viharas very closely, you'll already know that at a minimum, you're going to be reborn in the heavenly realm, which isn't the goal of this path to enlightenment. But it would be if there's going to be rebirth, you would prefer to be reborn in the human realm and or the heavenly realm, not going back down to the lower realms. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear that there are any questions at this time, sir. Okay, so we will move on to chapter 82. Uh, yes, sir. Um, can we go to Tonka to read chapter 82, please? Thank you, Miranda. Aspirations are not obtained by means of prayer. Householder, there are these five things that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. What five? Long life householder is wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. 
to beauty, householder is wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. Three, peacefulness, householder is wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. Four, fame, householder is wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. Five, the heavens are wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. These are the five things that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world. These five things, householder, <clears throat> that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world, I say, are not obtained by means of prayer or aspirations. If these five things that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and rarely gained in the world could be obtained by means of prayers or aspirations, who here would lack in anything? One. Householder, the noble disciple who aspires to long life, ought not to pray for long life or excite in it or possibly yearn for it. A noble disciple who aspires to long life should practice the way conducive to long life. For when he practices the way conducive to long life, it leads to obtaining long life and he gains long life either heavenly or human. Two, householder, the noble disciple who aspires beauty, ought not to pray for beauty or excite in it, or possibly yearn for it. A noble disciple who despires beauty should practice the way conducive to beauty. For when he practices, way conducive to beauty, it leads to obtaining beauty, and he gains beauty either heavenly or human. Three, householder, the noble disciple who aspires peacefulness ought not to pray for peacefulness or excite in it, or possibly yearn for it. A noble disciple who aspires peacefulness should practice the way conducive to peacefulness, for when he practices the way conducive to peacefulness, it leads to obtaining peacefulness. And he gains peacefulness either heavenly or human. Four, the householder, the noble disciple who aspires fame, ought not to pray for fame or excite in it or possibly yearn for it. A noble disciple who aspires fame should practice the way conducive to fame. For when he practices the way conducive to fame, it leads to obtaining fame, and he gains fame either heavenly or human. 5. Householder, the noble disciple who aspires the heavens, ought not to pray for the heavens, or excite in them, or possibly yearn for them. A noble disciple who aspires the heavens should practice the way conducive to heaven. For when he practices the way conducive to heaven, it leads to obtaining the heavens, and he gains the heavens. For one uh, desiring long life, beauty, fame, acclaim, heaven, high families, and lofty delights, following in succession, he wise praise motivation in doing deeds of merit. Being motivated, the wise person secures both, both kind of good the good in this life and the good of the future life. By attaining the good, the steadfast one is called one of wisdom. All right. Thank you, Tonka. Here, the Buddha is discussing prayer. And during the lifetime of the Buddha, there were people who prayed, the, uh, just like today. And during the lifetime of the Buddha, that was a lot of what was going on. The common people were going to Brahmin priests, which are Hindu priests, and they would pay a fee and have the Brahmin pray on their behalf. And they would oftentimes wish for these things that the Buddha is talking about, like a long life or beauty, peacefulness, fame, or being reborn into the heavenly world. And what the Buddha is saying is essentially, hey, prayer isn't going to produce those things for you. The thing that's going to produce those things for you is if you learn and practice the teachings, and if you practice the way and making wise decisions, then that's what leads to a long life. Because if in these other aspects that one might aspire for, because if you're out there killing a lot of beings, then beings are going to be interested in killing you. Your life's going to be quite short. 
So if you understand the first precept, for example, and you're not killing and destroying life, you're living compassionately for the welfare of all living beings, then you'll have a long life. But you need to practice that. If you just went and prayed for long life or had somebody pray on your behalf, and then you went out and you were killing and you didn't have the wisdom of these teachings, you're not going to have a long life. It doesn't matter what you pray for. Uh, same thing with beauty, peacefulness, fame, the heavens, and so forth. Sometimes when unfortunate circumstances happen uh, around the world, uh, you know, when I think about like school shootings or uh, mass shootings and things like this, you know, a lot of times people are saying that they're going to pray. Well, prayer isn't what's going to lead to peacefulness in our communities. Instead, what it is, is learning and practicing the teachings by eliminating craving, anger, and ignorance in the mind. And then people are learning these teachings throughout the world. That's what's going to eliminate the anger and hatred and ill will, this craving to want to kill, this unknowing of true reality and this ignorance of what that does when we do kill and we have these mass shootings. So praying isn't going to produce peacefulness in our communities, but instead by bringing these teachings to allow people to learn them and have them supported in our various communities and then people learning to train their mind and making wise decisions, understanding how unwise it is to kill, for example, and rape and do other things that are very harmful in our population, then more and more we practice the way conducive of peacefulness, that's when we'll actually experience peacefulness. But as long as we're unknowing of true reality and we keep praying for these things, they're not going to occur because praying for these things isn't what actually pr promotes these things and creates these things. It's making wise decisions. And as long as there's craving, anger and ignorance polluting the mind, an individual isn't going to be able to make wise decisions that lead to these five things. So if somebody's really interested in these five things, then the Buddha is saying practice the way that leads to this. That's what's actually going to allow this to be created in our society and for our own individual life that you can get to peacefulness in your own life not by praying for it but by learning and cultivating wisdom and training your mind eradicating craving anger and ignorance that's what actually leads to your peacefulness and all these other qualities that the buddha is talking about as well what questions do you guys have on this chapter yes sir i see that tom has her bad grace it's better for a question I'm just noticing that this has a lot uh, in common uh, with second feather, like no rights, uh, rituals, and worship. Is it? Am I seeing it right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Rights, rituals, ceremonies, and worship is going to uh, involve potentially prayer. It doesn't mean that you can't pray, right? It's not like as soon as you pray, you're not going to be able to get to enlightenment or something like that. Instead, if you look at volume one, chapter 18, I talk in there about prayer and I talk about a wise way to pray in order to ensure that you're not craving and yearning and longing and treating prayer like a genie in a bottle, that you're praying to some being or some entity and that you're asking for this intervention and you're treating it like a genie in a bottle because what prayer is ultimately doing for people when they pray if they if they pray uh, it's setting your um, mind towards certain positive outcomes it's not god that's going to intervene on our behalf or it's not some other entity that's going to intervene on our behalf and create these things for us it's us making wise decisions that are going to create these things so sometimes when people are praying what they're essentially doing is they're kind of doing affirmations in the mind it's almost like a loving kindness meditation where people are might be they think that they're praying to god to get peacefulness into the world. But in reality, their mind aspiring for peacefulness and having an interest in seeing all beings be loving and kind, through that prayer, they might actually then go out in the world and be more loving and kind. So therefore the world does become more loving and kind. In their mind, they're thinking that God is doing all of this when in reality they're not. They're actually creating that themselves through their own decisions to be more loving and kind. And they just happen to be praying, not realizing that it's not God that's doing this for them, that it's their own 
decisions, their own uh, training of their mind, their own uh, politeness, kindness, friendliness, and respect in the world. Now they're seeing more of that in the world around them. So someone can actually pray and still get to enlightenment and not be doing rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship. What that wrong observances uh, and behaviors is that's in that uh, third fetter is it's the mind needs to understand that rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship isn't going to lead to enlightenment because the number one problem is that in ignorance, that unknowing of true reality is the number one problem that's keeping the mind trapped in the unenlightened state. And it's wisdom that's cultivated in the mind that transforms that. It's not the rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship that will transform it. And prayer doesn't transform it either. So as long as you're understanding that and that your mind's not deluded, thinking you can do these auspicious or superstitious things to bring some kind of beneficial result, then you've eliminated wrong observances. And if somebody still chooses to pray and they understand that it's not a time to crave and yearn and long and treat God like a genie in a bottle, then they might still choose to pray and just kind of maintain a relationship and a conversation with this being if somebody uh, has understanding of this being of God. But as soon as the mind thinks that God is going to intervene on your behalf and create all this goodness in your life, this is wrong view. This is also the mind being deluded and having ignorance or unknowing a true reality. And therefore, with that understanding, then an individual isn't necessarily taking responsibility for their own actions. And now they might go out and do harmful things in the world and then just pray to God to make things better. But then they keep doing harmful things in the world. Their life keeps getting more and more difficult and they don't understand why. And they give up on this being God and they think he's not doing you know, his work. But in reality, this is just the mind's delusion or unknowing a true reality that they've been taught to pray to God like a genie in the bottle. And they're perceiving it as God's not doing what God's supposed to do. But in reality, they've just been taught the um, you know, false reality. They've been taught... Uh, that something that is not true. What true reality is, is this natural law of gamma of cause and effect or action and result. And when someone cultivates the wisdom around this, then they'll go out into the world and make better decisions about how they interact in the world. And then they'll experience better results. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. um, I see she has her hand raised. Let's go to her for a question. Thank you, Miranda. Um, Teacher David, um, if I heard correctly, there is similarity between the loving kindness meditation and prayer. Did I hear that correctly? If somebody puts it together that way, right? Like you could be in prayer, um, having a conversation with whomever you're praying to. And most people, I think, pray to God, but there's other people that someone might pray to. But as you're in prayer, you could be saying things like, you know, God, thank you for your love. I love you. I love all beings. You know, thank you so much for, um, you know, uh, everything that is here on earth. Uh, you know, you could be saying things and affirmations in the mind that's essentially promoting in your mind loving kindness. You're not asking God to intervene for you or to create any change for you because you realize that you need to do that work yourself. But you can bring in this kind of thing where you're cultivating loving kindness and compassion. And you look at that as your time in prayer as a way for you to do that, essentially rewiring the mind. I definitely teach loving kindness meditation because that's the way to eliminate anger, hatred, ill will. And that's the way that it I would recommend for anybody who's interested in eliminating that to do that. But if somebody's also interested in prayer and they understand that just asking God for things and craving things and treating him like a genie in a bottle isn't the way that any of this works, they can actually transform their prayer into more of kind of affirmation style where you're kind of affirming to God that you're aspiring to be a better person and you thank him for his support and his guidance and anything that he chooses to share with you because um, God can do those things. Uh, of course, there's some people who 
have no interest in a relationship with God, have no understanding whether that being exists or not exists, and that's fine. You can still get to enlightenment without that. But for those of you guys that are interested in maintaining a relationship with God, you'll need to get to the point where you're not craving in your prayer. You're not asking for wishes to be fulfilled and things like this. And this is a suggestion of how you can transform your prayer into more kind of an affirmation style, more of a conversation uh, where you're kind of affirming what it is that you're looking to accomplish in the world. And this could kind of set your mind up to uh, go out into the world and do wonderful things. Thank you. So can I ask further questions? Of course, you can ask anything you like. Okay, so the mind has struggled with um, sometimes when I'm doing loving kindness meditation in the mind, it feels like prayer. Um, and sometimes I think of it like prayer because that's what I'm used to. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like I justify that as that's okay, that's right view. But what I understand is like when Allie broke her arm um, praying then like praying oh gosh make this better asking for prayers like i understand that as wrong view that was wrong view prayer wasn't going to make her arm better prayer wasn't going to fix her arm um so if i'm understanding correctly the mind may not be wrong in feeling that when i'm doing the loving kindness meditation, I do the chants, I do, I say the hour father, and I do breathing mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation. Um, it, it may not be wrong in feeling like that's a prayer. Although not asking for these beings to be well, safe, peaceful, but just cultivating that with God. Is that wrong view? I don't think of what someone might choose to do is right or wrong, even though we use those words like right view, you know, right intention, right speech, and so forth. I think about it, what is wise? What is the way to transform the mind? And if you're in loving kindness meditation, cultivating loving kindness, realizing that you're doing the work to now cultivate this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well through this meditation. And now as you do that in meditation, you would like that to permeate in the mind and then go out in the world and now practice through your intention, speech, and actions to be loving and kind, which includes being polite, kind, friendly, and respectful to people. Then that's what you would like to do in loving kindness meditation where you're cultivating and doing the work to transform the mind away from this anger, hatred, and a will and arising this loving kindness. And if you, it helps you to think that God is with you while you're doing that, you know, that's fine. There's no harm in that. Um, it's not right or it's not wrong. It's what you're choosing to do. And, and, uh, but I don't think of it in the traditional sense of how we're typically taught prayer, where typically the way we're taught prayer is to ask for things. You know, whatever your wishes are, they'll be granted. And when you're doing loving kindness meditation, you're not doing that. And I think you know that you're not asking for anybody to make your you know, whoever you put in your rings, we'll just say mom, because uh, I used to do meditation a lot on loving kindness from my mom. I, will, I wasn't asking anybody to come make mom peaceful and safe and well and free of discontentedness. Instead, I understood that I was cultivating in my mind that I would like to see mom be peaceful, safe, well and free of discontentedness and now by me having those wholesome intentions now my speech and my actions improved when i was around her now i could sort out the relationship and 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 make it uh very uh you know conducive to us having a harmonious relationship so if you're doing loving kindness meditation in that way where you're not asking for intervention you realize that it's fully cultivation of your mind and you're the one doing the work then that's what loving kindness meditation would be. And if you choose to now use your prayer in the same way to cultivate your mind and just kind of affirm to God what it is that you're working on and what it is that you would are now choosing to address, this can be really um, motivational in your prayer. This can also be very confirming and affirming, and it can help you go out into the world with a better mindset of what it is that you're looking to accomplish in any given day. 
Okay, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes, thank you. Um, I see Max has his hand raised. Let's go to him for his question, please. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, Teacher David. Uh, I So I have uh, family members that are, that use uh, God or whatever as um, like the genie in the bottle and that's exclusively what they believe that they don't have to do any work and they just have to pray everything away and everything will work out in the end or whatever. Um, but there's really nothing that I can do to help them unless they decide to, um, you know, they basically, they have to want the help. It's, um, you know, I, I, I can't have craving desire attachment to help them. They basically need to find the help themselves or um, basically like, I guess the second part of the question would be, would my practice, you know, them seeing my practice would maybe influence, not influence them, but help them to understand um, maybe the changes in my life may um, understand that their um, lack of change maybe or whatnot would uh, um, help them. Yeah, so, you know, definitely if you're craving or desiring or attached to family being a certain way, you, you would like to get rid of that so you understand that, that as long as you're craving, desiring, attached for them to be a certain way, your mind's going to be discontent, so you need to let that go. And then in terms of them getting help, yes, they need to be interested in getting help um, and decide that that's what they would like to do. And your practice will definitely help them to see that. And it's not going to be a two month thing or three month thing. But over the course of years, as they see this transformation in you, they might then choose to become, you know, more of a person who's actually practicing these sort of teachings. Um, but at the same time, with all that said, that doesn't mean that you can't do anything. You can do things. You would just like to do it without craving desire attachment. So one of the suggestions I usually give is like gifting people this book, you know, like purchasing it, wrapping it up, giving it away as a present. It's a wonderful way to just kind of be like, here are some teachings. Not that you're expecting them to read it or you're wanting them to read it or you're nagging them to read it. But hey, here's a gift. That's one thing you can do. Um, uh, as you see that they're struggling, you can say, would you like my advice of how to resolve that? Or are you interested in my opinion of how you might be able to uh, address that situation? You don't need to use the word uh, Buddhism. Right? You don't need to use the B word. Uh, and you can just talk about these teachings without ever mentioning the Buddha's name. So you can still help people when they're open to it and you ask if they're interested and they say yes, then you can help them. But you can also do things like gifting a book or if you know somebody struggling with like a relationship, you might send them a video about true love or the chapter about true love or something like that. So there's things like that that you can do. If they reject it or they push it away, then you probably would be wise to no longer do that anymore. Like you're not interested in bombarding them with links and books and things like that because that would be your own craving. But if they're open to it and they're, they thank you for it and they actually got some value out of what you've sent them, uh, then wonderful, you know, you can continue to do that. And normally the best way to open that up is to first ask them if they're interested in your thoughts or your suggestions or your opinion. And as soon as they say yes, then you're able to help them. But also be prepared for the no, because not everyone's going to say yes. And they're not even going to say yes every time, even if it's the same person. They might say no sometimes. And that's the impermanence that you'll just have to get comfortable with. So that's for like, adult family members for your children and things like that you're much more influential with them and you've shared stories with me that you've experienced with your older son and how he's observing certain things that he that you're doing in your practice this is where our children can be more um can be in a role where they're actually learning because our 
a parent is what's considered your original teacher. The Buddha uses these words in his teachings that parents are the original teacher. There's other teachers that our children have, but parents are the original teacher. And I think about them as the most dedicated, the most committed teacher, right? Because our first grade teacher is in and out of our life in a matter of nine months or a year. But our parents, you know, they're influential throughout the course of our life. So you as a parent of children, you can surely help your children to learn these teachings. And this is one of the roles and responsibilities that we have as parents is to share wisdom with our children to help them in life. And these teachings are going to absolutely help them in life. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, it does not appear that there are any other questions at this time. Okay, so we'll move on to the next chapter, 83. Yes, sir. Let's go to Donnie to chapter 83, please. Thank you, Miranda. Should a monk be involved with gold and silver? Whatever monk should take gold and silver, or should get another ticket for him, or should consent to it being kept in deposit for him, there is an offense of expiation involving for, for feature. Whatever monk should engage in various transactions in which gold and silver is used, there is an offense of expiation involving for feature. Whatever monk should involve, should engage in various kinds of bartering, there is an offense of expiation involving for feature. In case a king or one in the service of a king or a Brahmin or a householder should send a rope one or mark a messenger saying, having got a rope in exchange for this rope fund, present the mark so and so with a rope. And then then if this messenger approaching that mark should say, Honored sir, this rope fund was brought for the vulnerable one, let the vulnerable one accept this rope fund, then the messenger should be spoken to thus by this mark. Sir, we do not accept a rope fund, but we accept a rope if it is at the right time and if it is allowable. If this messenger should say to the monk, but is there someone who is the vulnerable one's attendant, then monks, an attendant should be pointed out by the monk in need of a rope, either one who is engaged, by the engaged in the monastery or a household practitioner saying, this is the monk's attendant. If this messenger instructing this attendant approaching that monk should speak thus, honored sir, I have instructed the person whom the vulnerable one pointed out as an attendant, let the vulnerable one approach at the right time and he will present you with a rope. Then monks, if that monk is in need of a rope, approaching the dead attendant, you should stay and remind him two or three times saying, sir, I'm in need of a rope. If while stating and reminding two or three times he succeeds in obtaining that rope, then it's good. If he does not succeed in obtaining it, should stand silently for it four times, five times, six times at the utmost. If he succeeds in obtaining that rope, standing silently for four times, five times, or six times at the utmost, that is good. If he exerting himself further succeed in obtaining that rope, there is an offense of expiation involving for feature. If he does not succeed in obtaining it, he should go either go himself to where the rope farm was brought from or him, or a messenger should be sent to say that rope fund which you, sirs, sent for a monk is not of any use to that monk. Let the gentlemen make use of their own, let your own things be not lost. This is the proper cause in this case. Okay, you, you guys would like to stop. Okay, go ahead. Okay, another discourse. As he was sitting down at a respectful distance, Mandeka, the householder, spoke thus to the perfectly enlightened one. They are fortunate one. Wilderness roads with little water, with little food. It is not easy to go along them without provisions for the journey. It were good, fortunate one, if the perfectly enlightened one allowed monks provision for the journey. Then the perfectly enlightened one on this occasion, having reason, given reason talk, addressed the monk, saying, I allow you monks, five products of the cows, milk, 
curds, buttermilk, butter and ghee. There are monks, wilderness roads with little water, with little food, it is not easy to go along. Then, without provisions for the journey, I allow you monks to look about for provisions for a journey. Husk rice for him who has need of husk rice, kidney beans for him who has need of kidney beans, beans for him who has need of beans, salt for him who has need of salt, sugar for him who has need of sugar, oil for him who has need of oil, ghee for him who has need of ghee. There are monks, people who have confidence and are believing. These deposit gold coins in the hands of the old, these who make things allowable, saying, by means of this, give the master that which is allowable, I allow you monks. They are born to consent to that which is allowable. But these monks, I do not say that by any method may gold and silver be consented to, may be looked about for. Now on that occasion, the members of the king's company had assembled in the royal palace and were sitting together when the following conversation arose. Gold and silver are allowable for the aesthetics following the Satyan sun. The aesthetics following the Satyan sun consent to gold and silver. The aesthetics following the Satyan sun accepted gold and silver. Now on that occasion, Manikulaka, the headman, was sitting in that community. Then, Manikulaka, the headman, said to that community, Do not speak thus, masters. Gold and silver are not allowable for the aesthetics following the Sakyan sun. The aesthetics following the Sakyan sun do not consent to gold and silver. The aesthetics following the Sakyan sun do not accept gold and silver. They have renounced jewelry and gold. They have given up the use of gold and silver and Manikulaka was able to convince that community. Then, Manikulaka approached the perfectly enlightened one, paid homage to him, and sat down to one side. Sitting to one side, he reported to the perfectly enlightened one all that had happened, adding, I hope, Venerable Sir, that when I answered thus, I stated what has said, been said by the perfectly enlightened one and did not re misrepresent him with what is contrary to the truth that I explain in accordance with the teaching and that no reasonable consequence of my statement is ground for criticism. For sure, Edmund, when you answered thus, you stated what has been stated by me and did not misrepresent me with what is contrary to the truth, you explain in accordance with the teachings and no reasonable consequence of your statement gives ground for criticism. For Hitman, gold and silver are not allowed for the aesthetics following the Sakyan Sun. The aesthetics following the Sakyan Sun do not consent to gold and silver. The aesthetics following the Sakyan Sun do not accept gold and silver. They have renounced jewelry and gold. They have given up on the use of gold and silver. If gold and silver are allowed for anyone, the five courts of sensual pleasure are allowed for him. If the five courts of sensual pleasures are allowable for anyone, you can definitely consider him to be one who does not have the character of an aesthetic or a follower of the Sakyan Sun. Furthermore, hey man, I say this, straw may be sought by one needing straw, timber may be sought by one needing timber, a cart may be sought by one needing a cart, a workman may be sought by one needing a workman, but I do not say that there is any method by which gold and silver may be consented or to or sought. All right. Thank you, Donnie. Let me give you guys a little bit of backstory on this and then we can talk about it. So what the Buddha was doing during his lifetime was, of course, sharing the teachings that lead to the elimination of discontentedness, those core central teachings of the Eightfold Path and all the other teachings that plug into it. And while he was sharing those teachings with ordained practitioners and household practitioners, and all of these individuals can get to enlightenment, he created this ordained path that it's the same teachings to get to enlightenment. However, there are certain things in this environment that the Buddha provided guidance that they shouldn't do. And this is going to essentially create 
more condi conditions more conducive of getting to enlightenment. So if you guys have studied like the eight precepts, for example, you might see that the Buddha talks about eliminating singing and dancing and things like this. This is for ordained practitioners or anybody who might choose to do that. And you might choose to eliminate something like that for a period of time and train the mind to not have craving, desire, attachment. But then as a household practitioner, you can add that back in because you know that you don't have craving, desire, attachment anymore. But a ordained practitioner isn't supposed to be doing those kinds of things. During the lifetime of the Buddha, they could live without any kind of currency because they all they needed was food, water, clothing, shelter, and medical care, and they could sustain their life. And people readily offered them this in that area of the world that the Buddha lived. They readily were offering these kind of things. So there was no need for the currency, which was gold and silver at that time. They didn't need to go out and you know get a taxi cab or a bus or an airplane ticket. They didn't need to buy Zoom and uh, pay for Zoom or microphones or lights or things like this in order to share the teachings. They would just sit down in someone's living room or in a village or something like that and share the teachings. So they only needed to sustain their life with food, water, clothing, shelter, and medical care. So the Buddha set up a guideline where during his lifetime, people People didn't accept gold and silver. Uh, this was the currency of the time because they just didn't need it. And by allowing them to have it in this conducive environment, it just provides more opportunity for their mind to have craving, desire, attachment around wealth and money and things like this. So as you study the teachings of the Buddha, you'll see different places where when he's talking to the ordained practitioners, he's essentially creating this environment that's really stripped down, that provides very basic things so that the mind doesn't have much of an opportunity to have attachment. So that's why when you ordain you basically have two robes, you have a bowl, and that's essentially it. Um, because if you had a car, if you had a house, if you had a wife and uh, relationships and all these different things, the mind has more of a chance to get attached and hinder your ability to get to enlightenment and then be able to help household practitioners. So he's creating this almost like a Petri dish the best opportunity for this being to grow and develop and actually get to enlightenment and then contribute to others getting to enlightenment as well. So here he's talking about not having gold and silver or bartering, essentially doing anything around money or currency or something like that. Nowadays in the ordained uh, community, they do accept money and teachers like me, we, we need to accept some amount of financial contributions, otherwise we wouldn't be able to live there would need to be a student with me at every single moment to purchase every single thing that I need if I didn't accept some kind of currency, for example. And that is just really impractical the way that we uh, live our life today. But during the lifetime of the Buddha, they could just walk down the street. People would give them food, would give them water. They would offer them shelter to come stay at their house and share some teachings. They would have uh, medical care and clothing, all of these things taken care of, they didn't need the gold and silver. But nowadays, there isn't going to be somebody standing by my side every moment I go and need something to eat or buy a taxi cab to go here or there or a plane ticket or to purchase one thing or another. So today we do accept currency because it's something needed, but we still need to, as teachers, to ensure we don't have craving, desire, attachment. We don't have expectations for these financial contributions, because if you do, then the mind is still attached. It's not gonna be able to get to liberation. And then for household practitioners, it's the same thing. Of course, you guys are gonna to need to use the currency. You're gonna to need to have money to be able to purchase things, but what you would need to do is ensure that your mind isn't having craving, desire, attachment. That if your bank account has a really high balance, you're so happy, and if it drops down, you're sad, this is the mind being attached to money. Or if you get a promotion, you get so happy and so excited because you got more money, um, because then when you get laid off work, you're going to be sad or, or you know, otherwise discontent. So household practitioners can still get to enlightenment without with having currency ordained practitioners and teachers can still get to enlightenment while having currency but what you would need to eliminate is the craving desire attachment to acquiring excessive wealth if you have an aspiration to improve your income because you know you would like to have a better uh, living uh, 
residence for you and your family. You would maybe like to have uh, some better food, some better education for your children, things like this. There's no harm in having those aspirations, but it's when you're longing and yearning for these things, you're chasing after it. Uh, that's what's going to uh, cause discontentedness in the mind. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear that there are any questions at this time, sir. Okay, so we'll go to the next one, which is chapter six, uh, 84. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, let's go to Max to read chapter 84, please. Thank you, Miranda. Giving thanks. Now at that time, monks did not have, uh, did not give thanks in a dining hall. People looked down upon, criticized, spread it about, saying, how can these ascetics, sons of the Sakyans, give thanks in a dining hall? Monks heard these people who spread it about. Then these monks told this matter to the perfectly enlightened one. Then the perfectly enlightened one on this occasion, having given reason talk, addressed the monks, saying, I allow you, monks, to give thanks in a dining hall. I allow you, monks, to give thanks in the dining hall through a monk who is an elder. I allow monks, four or five monks who are elders or next in age, to the elders to wait in a dining hall. I allow you, monks, if there is a reason to go away, uh, having asked permission from the monk immediately next to you. Okay. Thank you, Max. So here, this is a very important teaching considering where we are in uh, human history at this point. We have a lot of teachers and ordained practitioners around the world who accept offerings, and they're not typically taught to necessarily give thanks. And uh, you'll see this if you make offerings. They oftentimes will not why to household practitioners they will not give thanks they will not even say thank you for offerings necessarily of course not everybody but a large majority of them function in this way and because of that what we see is we see that there could be potentially conceit we see that not only in the ordained community but in the household practitioners there can be conceit and arrogance you know thinking that I'm above you, I don't need to thank you, I don't need to show respect to you. We also see that there's problems that maybe the temples and the ordained practitioners and teachers aren't being supported as much because when people are giving their support, there's not even just a simple thank you uh, from a teacher or from an ordained practitioner to the person who's making the offering. So here, this is very key that ordained practitioners and teachers see that the Buddha absolutely taught to be thankful for the offerings that are being given uh, from the household practitioners to teachers and ordained practitioners. If you didn't say thank you, then of course your support is going to wane. So it's important that in order to maintain the practice as the Buddha shared is this natural law of gamma is that if somebody gives you something, of course, we should say thank you. We've always been taught that. But oftentimes when people become ordained, they feel like they don't need to do that anymore. But then they might be curious of why they're not getting support at their temple uh, for the things that they need in order to support their temple. And this is the reason why is because if you're not saying thank you, if you're not showing appreciation and gratitude to the people who are supporting you, then they're probably not going to support you any longer. So it's important to give that thanks and give that gratitude, have the utmost respect, because here's a group of people that go out into the world, they labor, they work, they do all these different things in order to earn income. And any kind of income or offerings that they offer to us as teachers, that means they're cutting it away from uh, having that for their own benefit or their family's benefit or what have you. And anybody who's living by donations of their students should have an enormous amount of respect and gratitude for their students being willing to provide that support to them and give them the opportunity to get deeper and deeper into their practice and be able to share these teachings more and more widely. So when we give thanks to our students for uh, making offerings, this continues to ensure that the support continues, that the students understand 
that they're appreciated and that the teachers have gratitude for them. But then it also sets an example for the students that when people give them gifts, perhaps in life, that they say thank you too. Because they're looking at the ordained practitioners and the teachers as a role model of how I should practice. So if ordained practitioners and teachers walk around and they don't show respect, they don't why, they don't say thank you to people when they get certain offerings and gifts, then this is what's going to be emulated in the household practitioner community that all of a sudden people aren't going to be interested in respecting each other. People aren't going to say thank you when gifts are being given and things like this. And we'll see this gradual decline in society where people aren't thankful, people are disrespectful and things like this. So by maintaining the respect and maintaining the thanks as the Buddha is teaching here, now the ordained practitioners and household pra or the house, the ordained practitioners and teachers are able to then uh, continue to be supported because they're sharing their thanks and their gratitude to their students. And the students can now have this role model of how to function in their own life that you should give thanks when people do nice, kind things for you. Not that you expect them to do those things, but when people do do those things, it's the proper way of practice to say thanks. And if we don't say thanks, then again, we'll probably experience people will be less inclined and less interested to help us in our life. So if somebody helps you move furniture or helps you to move logs or helps you with your car or picking up your children at school, of course, we should say thank you. And the Buddha here is saying, ordained practitioners and teachers, yes, you should give thanks when people are feeding you and people are taking care of you and people are making offerings. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Um, yes, sir. I have a question about this here. I allow you monks to give thanks in a dining hall through a monk who is an elder. Does this mean that if, if in a dining hall there are younger monks, ordained practitioners, and older ordained practitioners, that the older ordained practitioners should be the one giving thanks? And if so, why is this? The Buddha didn't give rigid guidance like that. He's just kind of essentially saying, okay, you guys aren't giving thanks to people. <laughs> you, know, you guys aren't thanking people. This is unwise. Just so that you know that it's okay, let me just open up the floodgates and say, okay, I allow you to give thanks to everybody, right? Because, you know, remember the Buddha was very respected by his students because they could see that the transformation that was occurring in their mind based on learning and practicing the teachings. Some of these people came and joined the Buddha as early as six years old, you know, seven years old. He was essentially like their father and, you know, they're listening to every word that he's sharing and trying to emulate his practice as close as they could. So he just needed to kind of open the door and say, okay, all of these options are available. Whereas if he would have just said the first one, then maybe, uh, people wouldn't have felt like they could do these others. So he's just opening everything so people don't feel reserved and need to hold back their thanks in any situation for any reason. Okay. Yes, I understand. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, it does not appear there are any other questions at this time. Okay. We'll go to chapter 85, which may be one of the shortest chapters that we've had. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Max, can you read chapter 85 for us, please? Yes, thank you, ma'am. An invitation to accept. When a monk is not ill, an invitation to accept a requisite for four months may be accepted, unless there be a renewed invitation, unless there be an ongoing invitation. If one should accept for longer than that, there is an offense of wrongdoing. Okay, thank you, Max. So here, the Buddha wasn't interested in his ordained practitioners wearing out their welcome, essentially, because if people are making an offering to come stay with them, you know, oftentimes people would stay for many weeks because that's how the household practitioners were learning the teachings, where, you know, people come to learn with me for like two or three hours at the temple, and then they go away, or they may come for a five-day course or a five or six-day retreat or something like that, and then they go away, right? where 
during the lifetime of the Buddha, these household practitioners had a lot of work to do in order to maintain the household. So having a teacher there with you and being able to absorb teachings throughout your weeks and months as all these things were happening, and then the teachers could kind of observe what was going on in your household and provide you guidance as they saw things that were challenging, this could be very beneficial. But the Buddha wasn't interested in people wearing out their welcome. So he said, okay, you know, I allow you to essentially accept an invitation to go stay with somebody in their home for not more than four months unless there's a renewed invitation or unless there's a sickness because then the person couldn't actually travel and things like that so he's essentially helping them to ensure that they're um, not wearing out their welcome with people that are inviting them to uh, stay in their home and stuff like that uh, any questions on this chapter it does not appear there are any questions sir Okay, so now we go to chapter 86. Yes, sir. I'll read chapter 86. Responsibilities of a teacher. Monks, when a cattle worker possesses 11 factors, he is capable of keeping and caring for a herd of cattle. What 11? Here, a cattle worker has wisdom of form. He is skilled in characteristics. He removes flies' eggs. He dresses wounds. He smokes out the shed. He knows the watering place. He knows what it is to have drunk. He knows the road. He is skilled in pastures. He does not milk dry. And he shows extra veneration to those bulls who are fathers and leaders of the herd. When a cattle worker possesses these 11 factors, he is capable of keeping and caring for a herd of cattle. So too monks. When a monk possesses these 11 qualities, he is capable of growth increase and maturity in the teachings and discipline. What 11? Here, a monk has wisdom of form. He is skilled in characteristics. He removes flies' eggs. He dresses wounds. He smokes out the sheds. He knows the watering place. He knows what it is to have drunk. He knows the road. He is skilled in pastures. He does not milk dry. And he shows extra veneration to those elder monks of long standing who have long gone forth the fathers and leaders of the community. And how is a monk skilled in characteristics? Here, a monk understands as it really is thus. An unwise person is characterized by his actions. A wise person is characterized by his actions. It is in this way that a monk is skilled in characteristics. And how does a monk smoke out the sheds? Here, a monk teaches the teachings to others in detail as he has heard it and learned it. It is in this way that a monk smokes out the sheds. And how does a monk know the watering place? Here, from time to time, a monk approaches those monks who are learned, heirs to the heritage, experts on the teachings, experts on the discipline, experts on the outlines and inquiries of them. How is this, I'm sorry, and inquires of them. How is this, venerable sir? What is the meaning of this? Those venerable ones then disclose to him what has not been disclosed, clear up what is obscure, and dispel his perplexity about numerous perplexing points. It is in this way that a monk knows the watering place. And how does a monk know what it is to have drunk? Here, when the teachings and discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata are being taught, a monk gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the teachings, gains joy connected with the teachings. It is in this way that a monk knows what it is to have drunk. And how does a monk know the road? Here, a monk understands the Noble Eightfold Path as it really is. It is in this way that a monk knows the road. And was a monk skilled in pastures? Here, a monk understands the four foundations of mindfulness as they really are. It is in this way that a monk is skilled in pastures. And how does a monk not milk dry? Here, when dedicated household practitioners invite a monk to take robes, alms food, lodging, and medicines and provisions for the sick, a monk is moderate in accepting donations. It is in this way that a monk does not milk dry. And how does a monk show extra veneration to those elder monks of long standing who have long gone forth, the fathers and leaders of the community? 
Here, a monk maintains bodily, verbal, and mental acts of loving kindness, both openly and privately toward those elder monks of long standing who have long gone forth, the fathers and leaders of the community. It is in this way that a monk shows extra veneration to those elder monks of long standing who have long gone forth, the fathers and leaders of the community. Possessing these 11 qualities, a monk is capable of growth, progress and fulfillment in these teachings and discipline. Here only eight of the 11 factors are shared as these eight apply to generosity and gratitude. See the included reference for the entire teaching. All right, thank you, Miranda. So I could go through this teaching in a lot of detail because there's a lot that the Buddha is talking about here, but I think you guys might actually get the gist of what this is because it's very clear, very straightforward, like pretty much every teaching that the Buddha shares. So I think what I'll do is just open up to any questions that you guys might have if there are any on this particular chapter. Uh, it does not appear that there are any questions at this time, sir. Okay, so we'll move on to next chapter and i've explained these in a lot of detail as you guys can see um chapter 87. yes thank you sir let's go to chrissy to read chapter 87 please thank you miranda reasons why a business surpasses forecast or fails venerable sir why is it that for one person here the business he undertakes ends in failure Two, why is it that for another, the same kind of business does not fulfill his forecast? Three, why is it that for still another, the same kind of business fulfills his forecast? Four, and why is it that for still another, the same kind of business surpasses his forecast? One, here, Suraputta. Someone approaches an ascetic or a Brahmin and invites him to ask for what he needs, but does not give him what was requested. When he passes away from there, if he comes back to this world, whatever business he undertakes ends in failure. Two, someone else approaches an ascetic or a Brahmin and invites him to ask for what he needs. He gives it to him, but does not fulfill his needs. When he passes away from there, if he comes back to this world, whatever business he undertakes does not fulfill his forecast. Three, someone else approaches an aesthetic or a Brahmin and invites him to ask for what he needs. He gives it to him and fulfills his needs. When he passes away from there, if he comes back to this world, whatever business he undertakes fulfills his forecast. Four, when someone else approaches an ascetic or a Brahmin and invites him to ask for what he needs, he gives it to him and surpasses his needs. When he passes away from there, if he comes back to this world, whatever business he undertakes surpasses his forecast. This Sariputta is the reason why for one person here, the business he undertakes ends in failure. For another, the same kind of business does not fulfill his forecast. For still another, the same kind of business fulfills his forecast. And for still another, the same kind of business surpasses his forecast. All right, thank you, Chrissy. What this is detailing is that if somebody went to an, a, an aesthetic, a, a, an ordained practitioner, a, a teacher and says, hey, you know, what can I offer you? What, what do you need? Because the way that we are practicing is we don't tell our students, like, give me this, give me that. I expect you to give me this. We don't uh, we just await what is given. This is the second precept. And part of that precept is that we just await what is given rather than putting demands on people of what to give us. But in certain situations, a student might come to their teacher and say, hey, what is it that you need that I can potentially offer to you that would be helpful for what you've got going on? And if a person invites an aesthetic, a Brahmin, a teacher, an ordained practitioner, uh, to share this, and then that person doesn't give what's 
been requested, the Buddha is explaining here that, okay, when you come back, your business will end in failure because essentially you offered to uh, get somebody something and then you didn't fulfill your, your um you know what was was asked for or what was needed in that situation and then the buddha goes through successive uh, situations of that ultimately getting to someone who hears what is needed and then surpasses that and gives more than what is actually needed um, and this is um, where your forecast of your business would exceed uh, any kind of forecast that you might look to have as part of your business so <clears throat> here the Buddha, essentially the takeaway that I would take is, uh, you know, of course, as he's been teaching all the way through is make whatever offerings you would like to make. But if you ever find yourself in a situation where you would like to ask a individual, you know, what is it that I can offer you and whatever they share, be sure that you fulfill that right, <laughs> or surpass it. Because the Buddha is saying, you know, if you fall short of that and you actually experience rebirth, then, you know, if you decide to have a business, it can uh, cause you complications in a future life. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear that there are any questions at this time, sir. Okay, so now we go to the very last chapter of the very last book. The one and a half years have all come down to this teaching, this chapter. Who gets the pleasure of reading this one? Um, can we go to Tonka to read chapter 88, please, sir? All right, Miss Tonka. Thank you. Eight causes and conditions for the destruction of families. I remember 91 eons back, had men, but I do not recall any family that has ever been destroyed merely by offering cooked alms food. Rather, whatever families there are that are rich, with much wealth and property, with abandoned gold and silver, with abandoned possessions and means of substances, subs, subsistence, with abundant wealth and grain, they have all become so from giving, from truthfulness and from mental discipline. There are, headmen eight causes and conditions for the destruction of families. Families come to destruction on account of the king or on account of thieves, or on account of fire, or on account of water, or they do not find what they have put away, or mismanaged undertakings fail, or there arises within a family fend thrift whose squanders dissolves and wastes away its wealth, and impermanence is the eighth. These are the eight causes and conditions for the destruction of families. But while these eight causes and conditions for the destruction of families exist, if anyone speaks thus of me, the perfectly enlightened one is practicing for the elimination of families, for the misfortune of families, for the destruction of families, if he does not abandon that assertion and that state of mind, and if he does not let go of that view, then according to his own consequences, he will be, as it were, dropped off in hell. All right. Yeah, <laughs> that's a pretty strong teaching there. I see Chrissy like, whoa, I haven't heard the Buddha talk like that before. <laughs> That's That was my take on it when I read it too. Um, so here, you know, during the lifetime of the Buddha, as more and more people were getting to enlightenment and started understanding what this is, I mean, massive amounts of people were coming out of the households and joining him to become ordained in order to get to enlightenment, because that's the best thing that could ever happen for an individual to choose to get to enlightenment. And there were, were certain rumors and slander and gossip that the Buddha's teachings were essentially destroying households. And here the Buddha had to share a teaching of what's really leading to the destruction of your household, because uh, he knew it wasn't him because what he was sharing was helpful to people and helping them get to enlightenment. And in fact, he instituted a 
um, guideline that you can't actually get enlightened unless you have the support of your parents, if you have a life partner or your children or people like this. And this is actually still in place here in Thailand. If you become ordained or choose to become ordained, your parents, your life partner, your children, if any of those people exist in your life, are the first people to cut the hairs off of your head in order to show their support that you agree. Because this person leaving the household, that's one less worker, that's one less income earner, one less person to be able to uh, sustain the household. So as more and more people were leaving the houses, uh, you know, he's being accused of damaging families and destroying families. So here he's giving a teaching of exactly what leads to the destruction of families. And the first one is on account of the king, because the king had a lot of power during that time where, you know, he could come in and just take away things, take away your land, take away your house. Nowadays, we might think of this as the government, right? The government could easily come in in some jurisdictions and, you know, do those kind of things. Um, the next one is thieves, right? If people came and robbed and destroyed a household uh, due to thievery, this could uh, destroy a family. Or fire or water, these things can destroy a family as well. Uh, they do not find what they have put away. This is like if you have savings, right? And you've, uh, during the lifetime of the Buddha, there wasn't, you know, banks where you could put it in a vault and it was government insured. Instead, it was like you tuck it under your mattress or you bury it in a hole out in your, your yard or what have you, uh, your, your currency. And what the Buddha is saying here is if you can't find what you've put away, then this could uh, damage uh, and destroy a family. Um, mismanaged undertakings, you know, so like certain activities and certain things that you're trying to produce, like if you're trying to grow a new field, a new crop, or you're trying to open a new business or something like this, that if it's mismanaged and it fails, that can destroy a family. Uh, if there's a spendthrift, somebody who is in the family and who, uh, you know, squanders the wealth or maybe gambles it away, wastes the wealth, uh, maybe they have extra marital affairs or something like this, or they're spending it on indulging in sensual desires like clothing or shoes. They're not allocating the money across the family to ensure that everyone's taken care of. This can destroy a family. And then the eighth one is uh, impermanence, that things just change, right? This is one of the fundamental teachings of the Buddha, but not everybody necessarily learned the teachings in the same sequential order. Uh, even now when I teach, you know, students come and go and join me at different times in classes, they didn't, might not necessarily know impermanence. So the Buddha is putting that in here so that it's very clear and very obvious that things just change essentially because of the universal truth of impermanence. And you guys see this teaching where he kind of sums it up here at the end that essentially if people continue to hold on to the view that he's destroying uh, families, this is essentially wrong view. And he says other places in his teachings that if somebody has wrong view and they die, that they're either reborn in hell or the animal realm. So why this sounds like kind of strong the way we read it today, if you understand his other teachings that essentially what he's saying is like, hey, if you uh, die with wrong view, you know, you're going to be reborn in hell. And he says in other places, the animal realm. So if somebody has the view <clears throat> that the path to enlightenment is destroying families, that's wrong view. Uh, that it's not what's destroying families <clears throat> and they will essentially be reborn into hell is what he's saying. So any questions on this chapter? There does not appear to be any questions at this time, sir. Okay. Well, it looks like we have completed our Pali Canon English study group for today and for a year and a half of going through each individual book. Next Saturday, we're going to be starting with volume two, chapters one through 10. You're welcome to read those. And that's going to help you get a lot more benefit out of this program because not only do you have the words of the Buddha there, but you have the reference to go back to the original source if you'd like to see what the Buddha was saying before or after this excerpt. And then you've got the reflections that I'm sharing to help you better reflect on this and truly gain the most benefit that you can out of reading the words of the Buddha. But you shouldn't rely on those. You should also do your own reflection as well. But I'm just helping you to understand the teachings uh, and putting it in language and relating it to 
things that we actually do today because you might not necessarily see the correlation between what the Buddha is teaching and what we're experiencing today. Even though I can see that very clearly, not everybody has necessarily studied these teachings as, as the same way that I have. So you've got an experienced practitioner and teacher helping you along with the reflections that I share there, but be sure not to rely on those. And then tomorrow in the group learning program, we're in the second part of our three-part series where we're doing the Eightfold Path and we're studying the moral conduct section. We're going to be discussing right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And then in our Wednesday class, we're going to be doing breathing mindfulness meditation. So you guys are welcome to join any of these classes that you like. They're all scheduled at the same time. They're in the same place right here online. And we've got all these same classes right here in Chiang Mai at the temple happening on the same exact days, just 9 a.m. in the morning. So I go there on Sunday, Wednesday, and Saturday and teach in the mornings to a group of people. And then in the evenings, I teach here online for the people who join online. And these two programs are completely in sync with each other. And you guys are welcome to join any of these at any time that you like. And then when you miss them, there's the recordings available for you. So thank you all for joining. Thank you for the moderators. If you've been moderating at any point throughout the year and a half, thank you so much for your help. If you've read at all during any time over the last year and a half, thank you so much. That helps contribute to the, the class and helps us get the most benefit out of it. If you've made any offerings or made any uh, you know donations to help me do the things that I need to do in terms of purchasing food, water, clothing, shelter, medical care, or purchasing the technology that I need to be able to share these classes. I would like to thank all of you for your generosity and for practicing in such a way that produces merit for you and allows the continuation of these teachings. So thank you all so much. We'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.